This is the Monday, August 8th, 2016 episode of The History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, our time machine is going to carry us back to meet one of the greatest masters of all time. Few names in history carry the weight of Michelangelo. He was a sculptor, painter, architect, poet, and engineer. But he was also mercurial, eccentric, and prone to fits of temper. Over the centuries, Michelangelo di Lodovico Bonarotti Simoni's reputation has fallen and risen risen and fallen, with each new generation, with everyone discovering things he has to say to them that are pertinent to their time. My guest, Miles J. Unger, is here to explore what the great artist is whispering to us across the centuries in the new book, Michelangelo, A Life in Six Masterpieces. The title calls this great master down from his Renaissance perch on the scaffold and brings him to a more human level so we can better understand his genius and relate to it as people who maybe can't paint anything more than a bedroom. The six masterpieces are the Pieta, carved in Michelangelo's 20s, all the way through to the Last Judgment, produced in old age. Along the way, there's also David, the tombs Michelangelo carved for his Medici rulers, the story of creation on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, and the soaring dome and vaults of St. Peter's Basilica, laid out when Michelangelo's hands were too unsteady to hold a brush or a chisel anymore, but his mind and eye still maintained their keen sense of aesthetics. Miles J. Unger currently writes for The Economist magazine, and he lived in Florence for five years, deepening his knowledge of Italian culture and language. He also served as managing editor of Art New England, and has published in numerous other places, including the New York Times. You can learn more about him at milesjunger.com, that's miles, the letter J, unger.com, or by tossing a like to his Facebook page. Okay, now that we have our brushes ready and our paints on the palette, let's meet Miles Unger and discuss Michelangelo, A Life in Six Masterpieces. I'm on the line with Miles J. Unger, author of Michelangelo, A Life in Six Masterpieces. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now, I picked up this book some time ago, so I'm excited to talk about it. It's one that's sort of been sitting there on my shelf, and you look at it, and you're maybe a little bit intimidated as a reader because you think it's about one of the great masters. But you bring him home to us in a way that he's sort of approachable. You're very much on his side, at least I was as I read the book. So let's talk about your criteria here, the methodology for selecting these six masterpieces. How did you choose which ones would highlight these different seasons of Michelangelo's life? Well, as you point out, the thing to do is to cover the seasons of his life. I wanted to tell the whole story of his life from youth to maturity to old age, but also works that express the full range of his skill and his mastery of a wide variety of media. He was not only the greatest sculptor and painter of his age, but also one of the foremost architects of the age. So I wanted to give works that would sort of cover the full range of his achievement. I didn't want this to be a scholarly work about the art and leave the man out. I think one of the most interesting things when you write a biography, perhaps the essential thing, is to merge the man or the woman with the work. Um, And I think in Michelangelo's case, this is particularly essential since 
it is really impossible to understand the work without understanding the man. And um, so I wanted to sort of run the full gamut of his range of expression, his, his skill in all the areas he mastered. So we begin with the Pieta work that he did in his early 20s that put him on the map was sort of a piece that showed off all his skill and was a kind of advertisement for himself or the other princes of the church who would then see this amazingly accomplished sculpture and hire him for their own work. So I go from there to the great patriotic statue he made for the Republic of Florence, his hometown, the David, which sort of is the epitome, perhaps the most emblematic work of what we call the High Renaissance the period in which sort of the optimistic period in which man was shown as this sort of great and glorious creature and that made him perhaps the most famous artist in Europe. And then we go from there back to Rome where he creates for a Pope Julius the Sistine Chapel with his famous image of the creation of man. And then we begin to see the darker side of both the Renaissance and Michelangelo in particular when we move back to Florence again and we see him sculpting the tombs for the Medici and there's a kind of anguish, darkness to this work. And then that continues on in the work he did again for the Pope in Rome, The Last Judgment. And finally, we get to the great work that he did in the final decades of his life on the Basilica of St. Peter's. These works sort of run the length of his very long 60-odd year career, but also, I think, give you a sense of his range of expression, the great skill he brought to three of the major areas of art. And I wanted people to see the great works, the, the works that can really sort of stand for all the others. So that's how I ended up selecting these particular six. I thought these did the trick. You mentioned something there in passing that you talk about in Michelangelo, A Life in Six Masterpieces, something that I know I had a hard time getting my brain around, and that is that before he picks up that brush, we could tell the story of art without the artists. They were separate. They weren't merged, I guess, the way that we think of it today. When we see something, even in a museum, even a great old work before Michelangelo, we'll look at it and say, who painted this? What was his story? I guess maybe it's part of the internet age. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to look up the artist and find out who it was. Mm -hmm. But you said this idea of not signing it with his art, it refused such anonymity. So describe how he changed the way we view that creative link. What a way, if you think about it, and you go back for art for thousands of years, Art was a form of magic, and if you take, let's say, a, a medieval icon, for instance, the idea of signing it, the art of signing it, worked against the function of the work of art. There's a story that was told in Florence, a story that Michelangelo well knew, because it had to do with a very famous painting in the city in which he grew up, in which a monk was supposedly painting an icon of the Virgin, and he couldn't get it right, so he throws his brushes down in frustration. But in the night, while he sleeps, an angel comes in and paints it and finishes the painting for him. Now, this concept of art as something miraculous almost, by definition, takes the artist out of it, because the artist, his hand is simply guided by some divine inspiration. Where Michelangelo, how he transforms art, is he says, no, the genius, the magic of art comes from the personality of the artist. And you can see that in the fact that he signed his early great work, the Pietà, very boldly across the blouse of the Virgin on the strap that carries his signature. And while some people thought this was an act of impiety, he is basically making a claim that the artist, the individual, you know, he, Michelangelo, made this. That was a significant element in the work of art. If a work of art is signed, in some sense, it no longer has that magic of something miraculous or something supernatural. Instead, that quality is ascribed to the artist and to his own idiosyncratic, individualistic personality. Michelangelo is making a claim that it matters who made it, that you can see the artist through the work and the work gains by being associated with a particular genius. And this is something that he pursued all his life. And I think this came out of his pride. Um, and I think I start the book with something where he says he grumbles to somebody who wants a painting by him. And he says, no, I was never one of those paintings who hung out a sign and advertised 
and kept a shop. Yeah. He said it was a very different kind of artist. He's an artist, and he said this many times, as an artist, you work with your mind, not with your hands. That is, you're not a craftsman, like a furniture maker or somebody who's very skilled. There are many wonderful furniture makers, but we don't generally think of a furniture maker sort of expressing himself in the work. And this is something that uh, Michelangelo really brings to art and makes that an essential part of what the work is about. Um, and from then on, we really have this concept of the artist as this kind of tormented genius who possesses a great deal of skill, but that's not really what he's selling. What he's selling is himself, his own genius, his personality that he imprints on the work of art. You say in one place in there, whoever thought of a, a brooding cabinet maker, an example, something mm -hmm. like that, where you say, but we all think of artists, okay, you're going to have to first get the beret and sort of be there, mm -hmm. a little bit of the beatnik vibe about you. And, and this is new. This is something new that he mm -hmm. brings. And what you said about being a painter and hanging a shingle when you're writing the book, I didn't think of that. It's just not because he is so ubiquitous in the way that we think mm -hmm. of artists. He writes, as you recount in the book, quote, when I told my father I wished to be an artist, he flew into a rage. Artists are laborers, no better than shoemakers, unquote. And at first I thought, oh, well, sure, any parent could relate to that today. But as I read the book, I realized Florence of the time was quite different. It wasn't just that, oh, how are you going to feed yourself? It was different because of this idea of what your station was. So mm -hmm. describe the social station of artists here in the late 1400s. Well, as his father said, he associated being an artist with being a shoemaker. There was a division in society between those who worked with their hands and those who worked with their brains. Now, to work with your hands made you a member of the working class. And even though by the time Michelangelo was born and came to maturity, that was beginning to change. There were artists who were famous and highly compensated for their work, but there was still that stigma that attached to everybody who worked with his hands. And that's why Michelangelo insists throughout his life that even though he worked with his hands, the real art came in the mind. Art was a form of philosophy expressed through paint or through carving in stone, but it was really an expression of mind. And this is something that he gets in large part through the years he spent as a guest in the house of Lorenzo the Magnificent, who was the great patron of art, of Florentine art, and who was himself a poet and a philosopher, and who surrounded himself with poets and philosophers. And so when he invites the 15-year-old Michelangelo in to be part of his house, to be a part of his household, he senses affirming that new sense of what the artist is, no longer merely a craftsman who has to paint according to the dictates of his patron, but rather a philosopher in his own right, a man who is the equal of a poet or a philosopher or even a great lord in many ways. And this is a constant tension in Michelangelo's life between the great lords who employed him, the cardinals and the popes and the princes and even the kings who wanted work from his hand, but who still tried to treat him as a household servant. And he bridled at this, you know, and he often threatened to walk out you know, even on popes, you know, when he didn't like the way he was being treated or he thought he was being slighted in some way and being relegated to that old sort of notion of the painter as somebody who just tell what to do and who may be skilled, but he's basically your employee. So Michelangelo struggles throughout his life to raise the stature of the artist into the intellectual class, the sort of equal of priests and writers and those other people who worked with their minds rather than their hands. That was a prince. I don't know if it was Il Magnifico's son, but he takes over, doesn't he? And he compares his Michelangelo to one of his other servants. He says, oh, these two are really good. I think it's a coachman or something of the like. And who was that? Do you remember in the book? Yeah. Of course you do. You wrote it. <laughs> he was comparing with Piero, known as the unfortunate, since he managed to lose his father's uh, fate in about two years. So he was tactless on many levels, but one of the tactless things he did was he said, oh, you know, yes, the sculptor Michelangelo is really good. I value him almost as much as my groom who can run as fast as my horse. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, yeah, so it was not everybody uh, appreciated Michelangelo for what he was worth. And, and Michelangelo, who was a very prickly guy, did not put up with such insults lightly and had a stormy relationship with many of his patrons who still like to think that they were the boss 
and uh, you know, the artist was merely there to carry out their wishes. In fact, before Michelangelo, the author of the work was generally considered to be the person who paid for it. And often that the patron would determine down to, you have to paint three clouds and six angels and they have to be standing in this such and such a place. Michelangelo would not put up with that. There's a famous scene sort of late in his life where Cardinal Cervini, who was the cardinal who was in charge of dispersing money for the building of St. Peter's, was complaining that he was kept out of the loop. And Michelangelo gets up in a very irascible voice, says, basically, you know, it's none of your business what I do. You're there to pay the bills, and I'm there to decide what's done with that <laughs> money. And if he hadn't been so famous and so revered, he might very well have been clapped in prison for that. But by that time, he had such a reputation that the Pope sided with Michelangelo rather than one of his cardinals. The Dallas Morning News called Michelangelo a life in six masterpieces, the one indispensable guide for encountering Michelangelo on his home turf. Describe a little bit of how that home turf would have been under Lorenzo il Magnifico, and then the lean years after il Magnifico passes away and Michelangelo is kind of once again cast on his own devices. Mm. One of the things that's hard to get our minds around, and when we go to, you know, as tourists, we go to Florence, we go to Rome, and they all, they're all part of this very civilized country. It seems to be part of one country. But back in Michelangelo's day, Italy was a dozen or more separate states, these little city-states, some larger than others. Florence was a relatively small city-state, but it was its own republic. And much of the work that Michelangelo did was done for the Republic of Florence. It was not done for Italy. There was no concept of Italy as a nation. There were these various states were often at war with each other. And in fact, the David in particular was made at a period and as a form of propaganda, Florence was being threatened by the son of the current pope at the time, Cesare Borgia. And there was a lot of internal dissent. So Michelangelo sculpts the David as a kind of traditional symbol of Florence, the small underdog state who will vanquish its rivals. And it's important to sort of understand that the city of Florence, the city-state of Florence, had a population of some 50 or 60,000 people. It was really very small, and it produced you know, enormous geniuses like you know, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci, and Donatello, and Brunelleschi, and Dante, and to the roster of sort of the great figures of Western art that came out of this small city-state are truly incredible. Michelangelo sort of serves this community, and he was a Florentine patriot all his life, even though he spent a large chunk of his career in Rome, where there was a lot more money and, and prestige to be had by being hired by the Pope. So this was a relatively small community where everyone knew everyone else, and he served to a large extent as a propagandist for the state, a sort of trying to, through these wonderful images of the heroic David. And later, he's called upon to paint this battle scene on the walls of the government building, again, as a way to send the message to the world and to the Florentine people in particular that the city was something that was worth protecting and would be able to va ultimately to vanquish its enemies. He spends some of the time in the kind of wilderness years, I guess you'd call them, honing his technical skills. And this was something that when I read the book, I was surprised to find because I didn't picture him down there camping out in the quarries with the stone cutters. And this is not only dirty work, but dangerous. He talks a couple mm -hmm. of times about a couple of them just didn't know what they were doing and would get crushed. So mm -hmm. this was uh, something that informed his work, though, later. And I thought many great artists or people who care about their work will want to follow it from the beginning to the end. How does that attention to detail impact his success later? Well, it's actually a double-edged sword. On the one hand, his perfectionism was an element in his genius. I mean, simply his, you know, hands-on insistence on doing everything himself. His first job in the art world was as a studio assistant in the large studio of Domenico Ghirlandaio, who ran a typical successful art studio in Florence. But he had dozens of assistants, and Ghirlandaio would supervise the work, but there'd be a dozen or so people working on the fresco. And this is how Michelangelo himself was trained. But as he said, he never kept a shop like that. He didn't believe 
in art by committee. He insisted, in fact, he was compelled to do everything himself. Every time he hired assistants, he was so hard on them, they often quit after a few days. He grumbled about them. They often betrayed him as he felt. So on the one hand, the fact that he was so deeply involved in every aspect of the work of art creates this enormously high level when he's actually able to complete them. But he took on way more than he could ever possibly do, particularly by himself, and his inability to get along with people and to sort of to give them large areas of responsibility meant basically that he would have these huge projects which delayed for years and then he would take on another project and then he couldn't hire anybody he liked and he would fire them. So on the one hand, Michelangelo's genius and his the, the mark of his hand and his eye is on those works that he created. But on the other hand, there are so many works that he left incomplete because he simply could not, you know, even in a long career, possibly get done all the things that he promised. And this often led to bitter lawsuits from patrons who paid a lot of money and then didn't get what they paid for. The perfect example is the tomb of Julius, which Michelangelo himself referred to as the tragedy of the tomb, which he worked on for 30 years but never completed and it's only a shadow of what he originally intended. And this was, again, because he could not bear to let anybody else do any of the significant work, and also the fact that he was very secretive. So he wouldn't tell anybody what he wanted, and then inevitably things went wrong, and he would get angry and fire them, and the whole thing would come crashing down. So in a way, his perfectionism is both a source of his genius, but also a source of some of the greatest failures of his life. My guest is Miles J. Unger, author of Michelangelo, A Life in Six Masterpieces. Bill Marvel of the Dallas Morning News wrote that there are hundreds of books about the great master, quote, but few bring it all together in such an entertaining and enlightening whole, unquote. I wanted to focus on the word entertaining. I know when I picked up the book, I didn't expect that on somebody of this stature, somebody who's been dead for such a long time. So how did you go about crafting that narrative that wouldn't read just like a textbook? Well, I try to, I think my third or fourth biography by now, and you know, I think when I approach it, first of all, you have to spend a couple of years with a guy, or if I write a biography of a woman, a few years with the gal. So you want to get to know that person, otherwise it gets very dull. And I think that's what you really want to convey to your readers. I wrote about Machiavelli, for instance. You read his letters, you try to figure out what he was like, what made him tick. And the same with Michelangelo. And these are, fortunately, both Machiavelli and Michelangelo are people who really do wear their hearts on their sleeves to a large extent. Some people are very reserved, particularly if they're famous people, sort of write only for publication, so they keep a lot of themselves back. Um, those are people are harder to write about it, but I found particularly with Michelangelo, he was such a, he was not somebody who could keep his emotions to himself. He was irascible, moody, and this really comes through in his letters and his relationships with people. And so the given, obviously, is the genius, the great body of work. But then you want to say, what underlies that? Who is the man who made this? You know, he wasn't born a genius, despite what his biographers like to say. He wasn't anointed by God. His genius came from his personality, from his pride, from his irascibility, from his desire to please his father, who was impossible to please. You know, this constant striving to sort of please a man who, no matter what he achieved, and, you know, here you have the greatest artist, perhaps in history, of a man who somebody at his death said was the greatest man who ever lived, he could never do anything right in the eyes of his own father. So if you can sort of get that psychological key to who he was as a man and how that created this amazing body of work, if you can do that, I think you have a compelling story. And that's what I tried to do. You know, there are very good art history books. And I'll tell you a lot about it and go into great depth into the works of art. And there are other biographies that are better on the life. What I tried to do is to integrate the two to show how they were inextricably linked, um, sort of part of one single thing. And I think in Michelangelo's case, that was very easy to do because he is an artist who really puts himself into the work. If you knew nothing about the biography of the man, you could glean an enormous amount from the work. 
there's this term that was often used about Michelangelo in his own day, terribilita. It's a little difficult to translate, but it sort of means a kind of awesomeness, a terribleness, a difficulty, a, a grandeur, but in a kind of threatening, almost overwhelming way. And, and you certainly see this in his greatest works, the Moses, many of the figures, either the figure of God in the Sistine ceiling or in the Last Judgment or those agonized figures of the Medici tomb. You really feel he wasn't simply carrying out a commission. He was channeling himself through the works. And, and that, I think, is something that makes him a wonderful subject for a biography in a way that, for instance, I think I would have a difficult time writing a biography of his great rival, Raphael. I may end up biting my tongue. Maybe I will someday. But <laughs> he's a much less, Raphael is this kind of good-looking, genial, very skilled, very gifted painter. But there's something so suave and so effortless about his work that you don't really ever feel you get to know Raphael through his work. He remains an enigma. He remains a performer in a way that Michelangelo, you feel, is never playing anybody but himself. You start off with that great letter of his. It's from a priest, and he just addresses it to Michelangelo, the painter. Mm -hmm. gets back to that idea of this being almost an insult to him. And he says, just ignore it. But he wants somebody to know that he got it and that it's an insult and that, mm -hmm. you know, let him think it went to one of the other Michelangelo's in town. But this is why it's so he does have that venting quality that comes across. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great way to open the book because right away you're looking over his shoulder and you're kind of on his side because you want to like him. You know, he created so much beauty. And then you see him interact with people later when he's maybe a little more irascible and he doesn't treat that nephew so great. And I think you're still sort of on his side. Mm -hmm. And he and other relationships that he has that I wanted to get in since we talked a little bit there about his faith and the way that the Florentine society would have looked at him. He's a devout Christian. He enjoys doing this work. He's compelled to do some of it, things like the Pieta. He's also temperamental and popes cannot always be so easy to get along with. So, or patrons in general at this time. So how do those relationships work out? People must ask you a lot about how he dealt with the popes in part because of the Charlton Heston movie. Mm. Yeah. So, so I remember the uh, Rex Harrison as Julius II. It seems like a slightly odd casting. <laughs> um, uh, Rex Harrison being far more urbane than the fiery, the irascible pope who gave Michelangelo as good as he got. It was really a clash of titanic egos. You know, Michelangelo was definitely a difficult customer. Perhaps most geniuses are. He didn't suffer fools gladly, and he saw fools everywhere. His basic idea was that if you wanted something done right, you had to do it yourself, and that anybody who told him anything about anything was a fool and ought to be ignored. I mean, even with Julius II, he tried to keep his work hidden from him. He was afraid that if he let anybody into the Sistine Chapel, people would steal his ideas. So he got along better with some popes than with others. With Julius, the man who commissioned the uh, Sistine ceiling, they had a fairly constructive working relationship. So again, they had a stormy relationship. I think at one point, Julius threatens to throw Michelangelo off the scaffolding after Michelangelo numerous times tried to keep him out of the chapel and tried to keep him from seeing the work that, after all, he was paying for. He got along better with Clement VII, who was much more tactful with him. Interestingly enough, he grew up in the same household or spent a couple of years in the same household with three different popes. Pope Leo X, who was Lorenzo de' Medici's second oldest son, Pope Clement VII, who was his nephew, and also Pope Paul III, who had spent a couple of years in the Medici Palace. So he knew a lot of these people as a young boy, and they all had very different reactions to Michelangelo and different ways of dealing with them. Pope Leo said in the beginning, when he first became Pope, Michelangelo is difficult, you can't work with him. And this may have gone back to some childhood rivalries, whereas his cousin, Clement VII, knew how to handle him. He knew he had to stroke his ego. He knew he had to treat him with kid gloves. He knew he had to allow him to do his own thing and to be brought gently to an idea rather than have it forced down his throat. Uh, perhaps the most difficult relationship he had with any pope was with Pope Paul IV, who was a hardline fundamentalist pope who 
founded the Roman Inquisition. And this was during the age of the Counter-Reformation where they were fighting with the Protestants and they really wanted to get rid of a lot of what they thought was the pagan licentious art that had been permitted under previous popes. And he, he was the one who insisted that they paint garments over all the more indecent aspects of the Last Judgment. So he had a very tense relationship with Paul IV. It was a very mixed bag, and the popes who did better with him were ones who were understanding and who sort of knew how to deal with his pride and his ego and his insecurity and gave him pretty much free reign to do as he wanted. In describing Michelangelo's contributions to St. Peter's Basilica, you write of his ability to create in three dimensions, not just two. You write, quote, weight, mass, tension, stress. These are not simply problems to be solved by the engineer, but the very soul of the building, unquote. Compare his approach when building to those of his contemporaries. Probably the greatest uh, architect of the earlier Renaissance was Bramante, who was another artist with whom Michelangelo had had an enormous rivalry and tension while he was still alive. Michelangelo tended to be much more forgiving and and much more appreciative of artists' genius after they were already dead and no longer a threat to him. But Bramante saw architecture primarily in terms of abstract volumes. The design he did for St. Peter's was basically an enormous dome, very much resembling the dome of the Pantheon, which he had studied at great length, over a kind of massive Greek cross. The kind of very pure, austere geometry based on the basic geometric solids, the cube and the sphere and so forth. What Michelangelo does and what was considered revolutionary is is he is much less interested in pure abstract geometry. And if you look at his greatest architectural works, if you look, for instance, at the the so-called hemicycles, which are the areas around the dome in the back of St. Peter's, you can see that they're kind of oddly proportioned, that they seem to move, they seem to undulate like an accordion, they seem to squeeze together and then pull apart, they seem to flex. And this comes out of his sort of understanding of the human body, which he gleaned studying anatomy and in his years as a sculptor, he really saw buildings as an organism, as a body in which the structure had to react to those basic stresses. You know, you have this enormous dome. So visually, he bunches together the columns in certain areas and spreads them out as if they're kind of like muscles contracting and relaxing. So it's a much more dynamic sense of what architecture could be. And it's based on his notion of that in order to understand architecture, you needed to understand the human body. And he wrote in a letter to somebody to that effect, somebody was questioning, you know, what skills do you bring to the role of the architect when you, after all, you're only a sculptor and a painter. And he says in response, that is the essence of what architecture is. It's really the human body writ large. And so it's a much more kind of dynamic, expressive form. And you can see this also in the famous vestibule of the Laurentian Library, where that famous cascade of stairs that aren't simply typical rectangles you expect in the stairs, they billow and they swell and they seem to spill out like cascading water. Or if you look in the Campidoglio, the great square that he designed in Rome, instead of basing his forms on the traditional rectangles and circles, he bases it on the trapezoid and the spherical pavement that seem to be squeezed by the buildings on either side of them. So his sense of what architecture was about was about movement and flexion and growth and contraction, all those things that we associate with a human body moving in space almost as if he were a kind of choreographer of stone rather than simply a builder of sort of abstract geometric volume. While he's painting creation on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, thing you talked about before about how he draws God, I kept thinking of the title of Charles Learson's book, Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty. He's sort of this terrible, (laughs) wonderful, incredible person, but you're a little scared of standing back from Mm -hmm. him. And it's sort of the way that he depicts God. And this is bold. Mm -hmm. You write that 
him doing this quote speaks volumes about Michelangelo's self-confidence that he dared tackle the most difficult, most unpaintable subject in all of art. And you describe some of the outrage that's provoked by The Last Judgment as unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, again, today we expect, even demand that art be provocative, that it make us think. And we accept sometimes it's going to be controversial. We're not always going to like what it provokes in us. But give us some insight into the unique political pressures of Michelangelo's day as far as drawing these or painting these for the church. Well, one of the things about Michelangelo's day was that it was not a single day. He had a long career, a long life. He lived to be 89 years old. To take, for instance, the Sistine ceiling, which he painted in the early decades of the 16th century, and 30 years later when he comes back to The Last Judgment, the world had changed. The kind of optimistic spirit of the Renaissance, which we see in the Sistine ceiling, in the creation of Adam, let's say, which is seen everybody knows and everybody loves, partly because it's a wonderfully affirmative image, perhaps the most affirmative image of the power and the glory of man, sort of beautiful creature created by God, perfect in his image. And if you contrast that to the Last Judgment, and if you think about what happened between those two campaigns of painting, you had the coming of Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, which seeks to fight off the challenge of the Protestants. And the church is trying to reform itself as a means of sort of meeting the, meeting the moral political challenge of Martin Luther and his followers. So you have that on the one hand. So you have a much more greater insistence on sort of towing the party line of serving the church in a very direct way so the kind of license that Michelangelo once took with telling scriptural stories, the kind of joyous paganism of many of his images would no longer fly 30 years later. In 1527, you had the sack of Rome by troops under the Emperor Charles V. And the sack of Rome is one of the most brutal and bloody and traumatic events in the history of Europe, where thousands and thousands were killed and tortured and raped and buildings plundered and monasteries destroyed, many of these by Protestant troops who were serving under the Emperor Charles V. So it was a very different age, a much darker age. And you also had at that time within the church, the church was struggling to hold the moral high ground, but you had many people who felt that the church had lost its way. It had become corrupt. The cardinals and the priests were all interested in their own material well-being. They all had their mistresses. They ate well. They lived in palaces and ate off golden plate. And as long as the church was the only game in town, well, that was fine. But once Martin Luther and the Protestants posed this moral challenge, the church, both the hierarchy and the flock, had to re-examine what they were about. What did the church stand for? And Michelangelo, who was a very deeply spiritual person, but like many of his contemporaries, was skeptical of the official church. And he knew that the priests were corrupt and the cardinals and popes themselves were having children. But like many Catholics, who were not willing to go over to Protestantism, he wanted to find a much more personal expression. And this is what he does in The Last Judgment. The Last Judgment is perhaps the greatest Catholic response to the challenge of the Protestant Reformation in its deeply personal response to the whole notion of salvation. In Michelangelo's Last Judgment, salvation is not something that is achieved through ritual through good works. It's very unpredictable. It's chaotic. It's violent. The overall impression you get from looking at The Last Judgment is this great sort of storm of people swirling, some being pulled upward, some being dragged downward. The world is in a state of kind of chaos, and there's no priest to guide you. The church is not there to guide you. Even the Virgin Mary, who is supposed to intercede on behalf of sinners, has sort of given up. So it's a very pessimistic, dark vision where we're all sort of struggling for salvation alone. And this is something that the church felt very uneasy about. And so Michelangelo, when the Last Judgment was unveiled, many in the church, including popes and cardinals, thought this was basically heretical, that he was skirting dangerously close to the Protestant belief 
in the justification by faith alone. That is the idea that it was each individual conscience, each individual relationship with God, rather than the performances of the sacraments that determined grace, that determined salvation. And not only that, but the fact that he painted many of the figures nude didn't sit well with many of the cardinals who thought they were basically obscene. So there was enormous pressure on Michelangelo to sort of mend his ways, and he was attacked vociferously in the press by the poet Aretino, which is a bit rich since Aretino was a far more loose-living fellow than Michelangelo ever was. But he took advantage of the general spirit of the time to sort of condemn him as a kind of blasphemer and a creator of obscenities. So it was a very difficult time for Michelangelo, and only the intercession of his friend, Pope Paul III, sort of saved him from perhaps getting brought up before the Inquisition. Art was a much more public, and it was meant to serve the purposes of public institutions. And so anytime you sort of deviated from the party line, you were subject to enormous amounts of criticism and pressure. Let's mention David briefly as we move towards the end of the six. That one, though, takes place in the Renaissance, so it's not at the end. But it says something about this Renaissance attitude about man and his place in the universe that I wanted you to share with people. You know, I always think when I, I look at the David, I think of that wonderful line, which I can't quote exactly, but from Hamlet, what a piece of work is a man, so infinite mangling the quote, but, you know, that sort of that idea of man as a sort of perfect being approaching a god, a thing divine of the angels. This is really the sort of epitome of the high Renaissance belief. Here you have this enormous figure, nude, with nothing but his own powers, facing down the great giant Goliath. But it really is man in his perfection. And I think if any image sort of stands for that Renaissance belief, in the power, our own power to shape our destiny. I think it's the David. This is not something that runs throughout Michelangelo's life. I mean, as we move on, as we move into sort of darker times and the disruption of the sack of Rome, and we move to sort of the Medici tombs and the Last Judgment, we see a much darker vision of man. But here in the beginning, in 1504, we sort of see Michelangelo presenting man as the hero man as the holy warrior, sort of complete in himself, beautiful, both in body and in spirit. Because after all, David is not simply a man, but he is a warrior on behalf of the divine. He is a holy warrior, and his perfection and his poise and his will reveal mankind at his best, at his pinnacle. And I think that he stands for that very brief period in which there was this belief in perfectibility of man, that idea that we associate with the Renaissance, where man is made the center of the universe and the sort of shaper of his own destiny. Okay, we've touched on each of the six. I wanted to close by asking you to speak directly to people who maybe have no real interest or aren't really studied in art, kind of the know-what-they-like sort of cliche. What inspiration will they find in Michelangelo, A Life in Six Masterpieces? I think Michelangelo represents art at first at the highest level in terms of skill, But also in terms of expression, I think what Michelangelo does is he invests his work with life, with personality, with that notion that the artist is a kind of almost a magician, a magus. Um, And I think it's very difficult to understand. I think our image of what an artist is really comes out of Michelangelo claiming a unique role for the individual point of view. I mean, he insists, like nobody else before him, that what makes an artist is his own singular point of view. It's not simply enough to be an incredible craftsman, to have the technical skills. You also have to be able to impose your point of view, your personality on the work of art. And this is really something that is accepted, is universally accepted now. We don't think of fine artists as simply being skillful craftsmen. What distinguishes an artist from other forms of artisanal work is that 
expression of personality, that individuality, originality. And I think that's something that you can see in Michelangelo's work and something that certainly changed the course of history. For those who are, have seen the, the image of creation of man and the Dave, and they're all very familiar images, and some people enjoy just seeing the familiar images. If I were to do one thing, if I were to sort of try to get understand Michelangelo in the space of an hour or so, I think what I would do is go to the museum in Florence where the David is, but not so much to see the David, which will be familiar to everybody, but to see the unfinished works where you can really see the form emerge from the block. I mean, this gives you a much closer much more intimate sense of Michelangelo actually working through the material, sort of exploring the stones, digging into the stone and finding, as he always put it, finding the form within the stone. They're deeply moving because they're uncompleted, because you can see the mark of the chisel on them, because you can see him really probing and not as the work of art as a kind of completed and perfected form, but as something, you know, sort of in process. I think these give you perhaps the greatest insight into Michelangelo, the man, the artist, and the genius. And by the way, that is part of the book. You add something at the end for people fortunate enough to see these works up close. A very nice little kind of almost travel log there at the end of the book to give us the benefit of your eye when planning our trip to look at these great works. Mm, yeah. Miles Janger, author of Michelangelo, A Life in Six Masterpieces. Thank you so much for introducing us to this fascinating man in history and the original brooding artist himself, Michelangelo. Best of luck with the book. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Again, the book is Michelangelo, a life in six masterpieces. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at our website, historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there. Or even bookmark the URL off the Amazon.com banner ad on our homepage. Amazon.com gives us a small portion of every purchase you make at no additional cost to you. And that money helps keep us in paint and highlighters. Once again... My sincere thanks to Miles J. Unger for joining us and bringing the great Michelangelo into our studio for a visit. You can learn more about him at milesjunger.com or by liking his page on Facebook. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or at facebook.com slash history author. I hope you'll join us next time for another trip into the past here on iHeartRadio or wherever you're listening. And remember, if you do subscribe on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. Until Classical Wisdom Wednesday, History in Five Friday, or next Monday's interview, thanks so much for listening, and happy time traveling. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.